Chuck Olenek, I'm a reenactor. For 36 years, I used my weekend hobby of living history to bring history to life for my students in the classroom. And to that end, I'd wear the garb and all that stuff. Well, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I have a whole room full of garb in the house that I can't bear to get rid of because it's just cool. And I still have a passion for bringing the past to life. And I like to play history detective. So I had to repurpose myself once I left the classroom. And I decided that I would take a deep dive into California history because I was fascinated by it. But it was something I never got to teach because of my curriculum. So I started throwing garb in the back of the Explorer and I started going up and down the state, you know, researching each of the missions because that was an easy start. And then, you know, Presidios and then finding out there were Assistencias, potential spin-off missions. So I had to go visit those and track those down. Sometimes they would just simply be a plaque by the side of the road or sometimes there wouldn't even be a plaque. There would just be an address of where a plaque used to be. And while I was doing the research, I stumbled across outlaws hanging out in saloons inside desecularized missions, which kind of twisted my brain around. And I started tracking down those guys because it was just fascinating to me. There were a number that were classed as prototypes of Zorro and you know they were you know, stage robbers and then I stumbled across train robbers and stage robbers who hated big corporations and so this leads me to Chris Evans and John Sontag two of the more notorious train robbers that came out of Tulare County. And this is the second part of my journey following them and you know tracking their trail and telling their story. So I hope you stick with me on my journey. Now, between 1889 and 1903, there's going to be over 340 train robberies in the United States. 99 people are going to get killed during these train robberies or attempted train robberies because not all of them worked. And Tulare County has the distinction of producing the most train robbers out of any county in the United States because you not only have Evans and Sontag, who is later going to be joined by his brother. You also have the Dalton brothers. Uh, I think their uncle had a place outside of Paso Robles. You also had the Tulare twins, uh, Ben and Dudley Johnson, who hero worshipped uh, the Daltons. And by the way, Grant Dalton worked with Chris Evans in a warehouse before they turned to lives of crime. And these guys imitated each other. They probably inspired each other. And so they've kind of created a bit of a firestorm over time. And the Pixley robbery, Grant Dalton got blamed for it and got arrested and he later busts out of jail and escapes. Um, and what ends up happening too is now there's this whole series of robberies that are taking place in the southern part of the San Joaquin Valley. So trains are getting hit and the way there's an MO that is uh, starting to become obvious. You know, at least the way Evans and uh, Sontag worked it. They liked to station horses about a couple of miles from the depot of you know where the train was going to be where that they were going to rob 
and they would walk down to the depot and they'd kind of slide onto the train then they'd climb over the top and they'd get to the engineer and the fireman and stop the train basically where the horses were and then they would go to the express car with these two hostages and again the demands would be open up or we're going to kill these guys and sometimes they'd use explosives to uh, blow up the express car so places like Goshen are getting hit Tipton um, Alila, which is later going to be called Erlemont. Oh, by the way, the Daltons take credit for that one, but then so did uh, Evans and Sontag. Sontag and Evans traveled to Minnesota where they met up with Sontag's brother, George Conton, a former train brakeman who had been released from Nebraska State Penitentiary in Omaha after a serving time for embezzlement. On July 1st, 1892, they robbed a train while riding along the Minnesota River and acquired nothing of much value, but their crime aroused the concern of Pinkerton detectives. A month later, they traveled to California and robbed a train at Colas, originally named Colas Station for the railroad's president, now Kerman, in Fresno County. They were more successful this time, netting $500 and bags of Peruvian and Mexican coins of no apparent value. Several days later, law enforcement officers arrested Conton in connection with the crime, but Sontag and Evans had fled and spent almost a year as fugitives. John's brother, George, was convicted of the Collis robbery and he went to Folsom State Prison. Evans and Sontag remained in hiding in the foothills near Esham Valley. While getting supplies at the Evans farm, the pair are surprised by a posseman who's been hanging out there and hiding. When they reach the gate, Evans and Sontag open fire and gunfire is exchanged and Wilson and McGinnis fall dead. Uh, Woody's been shot in the neck. And, you know, this posse has returned fire. As the uh, pair of outlaws are escaping, Sontag's been hit in the arm. They keep moving. They head to the Sierra Nevadas. They're hiding out. While they're hiding out, Ambrose Pierce and Joaquin Miller are writing about these two in a San Francisco newspaper. The story is getting spread all over the place. And these two are being painted as Robin Hood figures. They are getting a lot of sympathy from people who hate the Southern Pacific Railway. And so they're managing to evade capture for months. Following the incident at Young's Cabin, Things were pretty embarrassing as far as the law chasing Evans and Sontag were concerned. They couldn't catch these guys for months. People in the mountains were evidently providing food and shelter. People in the valley who had a real strong hate for the Southern Pacific, they were giving assistance. And Evans and Sontag were able to freely move back and forth. They often visited Evans' home outside of Vesalia and spent the night there. The final shootout of the, you know, with the Evans Sontag gang, it's going to take place at uh, Stone Corral in the Esham Valley, which happens to be on private land, so I can't film there. And what ends up happening is for three days, Sheriff's men are waiting in a cabin at the foot of a hill and on the fourth day they're rewarded with the sight of their quarry. So the lawmen see their quarry resting by a manure pile you know, from their uh, travels. You know, they're kind of worn out. And Evans notices the lawmen 
before they start shooting. So he shoots first. And now bullets are going back and forth and people refer to this as the battle of Stone Corral. And you know, there's some talk about hundreds of rounds were fired. It was known that both of the outlaws had, each had a shotgun, each had a rifle, each had a pair of revolvers. So there's a lot of bullets going back and forth. And this goes on for like about an hour and a half. And um, at the end of it, one of the lawmen has taken a bullet in the leg. Sontag and Evans are both messed up. And what ends up happening is Sontag realizes he's dying. And he is pleading with Evans to kill him, finish him off. Evans won't do it. So then Sontag points out to Evans, you have a family, get out of here. And reluctantly, Evans leaves, disappears into the dark. The lawmen are not all that eager to go up into the dark against Sontag by himself. They don't know that Sontag's alone. They're not all that eager to go up there. And they're waiting until morning when the cold, you know, the chill of the morning stiffens Sontag's wounds. And then they walk up there, they get to him, and, you know, photographs are taken. So evidently, this is a big deal. Evidently, someone, you know, a, a photographer was around for this. Okay. And they arrest him, and they put him in the Fresno jail. And what ends up happening is he's going to die, like, about three weeks later. Maybe it's from the wounds themselves that didn't heal or maybe it was tetanus uh, by the way he's buried in Fresno and the grave marker is actually wrong it's off by a year you know as far as you know his death marking it is uh, 1892 it's supposed to be 1893 now as far as Evans is concerned Evans makes it eight miles to a friend's place in Auckland and that friend betrays him. Because remember, there's a reward. And um, so he tells the sheriff, well, okay, the way it was described was Evans virtually surrendered. At this point, he was so weak from his wounds and loss of blood he couldn't really put up a fight. So he's now going to be taken to the Fresno jail, you know, and he's going to get locked up. So that's the end of the Evan Sontag gang. But now we're going to have to deal with Evans and his escape from the Fresno jail and his new partnership with Ed Morrell. So I hope you stick with me on my journey.